Good morning, everyone. And again, welcome back to English Poetry at the Islamic uh, University. Uh, last time we had uh, a poem uh, on war. Uh, we said that uh, this is one of the most important genres in the early 20th century because of the, the Great War or the First World War. Uh, the two poems we studied before are also classified as 20th century literature, but I, did, I wanted to uh, highlight this genre of war uh, writing and post-war writing. Today we move to uh, one of the greatest poets and perhaps critics of the 20th century, early 20th century, first half of the 20th century. His name is T.S. Uh, Eliot. There's a quarrel whether T.S. Eliot is American or, or British. It's, a, it's something that I don't find relevant sometimes to the discussion of his, of his poetry, but some people might just spend hours fighting over this. But I'm including him in this English uh, poetry course, so I'm taking him uh, as a, an English man. Some people will say he chose to be English, that's why he's more English than, but he's a universal figure. He was a universal figure in many ways, like many poets. <coughs> the poem, probably you know uh, T.S. Eliot as the poet of uh, the wasteland, of course. Considered by many to be the greatest uh, poem of the 20th century, a masterpiece. Uh, we also mentioned him before, right, in the course. Yes. We mentioned him as a critic, yeah. not, as a, not as a, a, a poet. What did we say about, uh, about Eliot? What did he do? What, what, the, what did he contrib contribute? Uh, after 300 uh, of, uh, of John Donne's works, he, uh, he makes like rebirthing uh, of, uh, of John Donne and his mm -hmm. works. So did he like it or did he hate it? Like it, actually. Okay. So that's, that's interesting. When we talk about John Donne, who was excluded, almost totally excluded by the mainstream critics of his time, and then 300 years later we have somebody appreciating John Donne, liking John Donne, and actually promoting the works of, uh, of John Donne. Uh, T.S. Eliot is uh, considered to be the man, He's, he, it wasn't him actually, there was uh, another guy called Herbert Grierson who published a book on the, on the metaphysicals, and then uh, T.S. Eliot uh, praised these uh, poets and wrote a, a review of that book. But you know how sometimes when famous people like something, and that's why in the age of Instagram we have the promotion and the marketing by, by celebrities, sometimes they're paid millions. I'm not saying anything against T.S. Eliot, but sometimes when important famous people say stuff, everybody would be like, oh yeah. And in this case, this is good. This is good. I think also T.S. Eliot was influenced in a way by, by, by John Donne. He, he didn't only just like him, or appreciate him or promote him, he was influenced. We'll see this, uh, I'm not sure if you want to spend time tracing the, the impacts of John Donne poetry on, on T.S. Eliot. Today we have this poem called The Hollow Men. Have you read it before, The Hollow Men? I posted a video last night uh, of a recitation. One of the recitations, by the way, was by T.S. Eliot himself because he died like almost 50 years ago. But this poem, I think, was written in the, in the, in the 20s, 1920s, something like this. The hollow, what's hollow? What's hollow? What's, what's more poetic, hollow men or empty men? Or both, or it depends on the context. But I, find, I, I find the word hollow to be yeah. fascinating. There's a movie, an old movie called Hollow Man. Mm. The Hollow Man. It gives this idea. I'm not sure if we can consider this onomatopoeic in a sense, but there is this thing about hollowness, emptiness, in the word itself, echoed in the word itself. Uh, some of you will consider this to be a long poem. It's not, because I would because three pages. The other poems we studied are very, very short. So this is a short, just a short poem. 
I'm not even going to say it's a very short poem. Let's see this poem by T.S. Eliot. It actually doesn't begin directly. We have probably have seen this with The Wasteland. He doesn't go directly. There is a subtitle. And the first subtitle, can you read somebody? The, the subtitle. Mista. What's Mista? Can you, can you find it in the dictionary? Hmm? Mis a name of somebody. This is the first name and this is the surname. Mista. What is some kind of pronunciation, a dialect, an accent? French? No. I think it's like black English. Like African English, African American English. Mr. Mr. Kurtz. He did. And we also noticed something here. This is grammatically incorrect. Right? But how is it related to the whole thing, the whole poem? Okay? If you write in your exam papers, he did, the teachers will be like cross. But if, <laughs> but if T.S. Eliot does this, or somebody else, the, te the same teacher would be spending hours analyzing this and speaking about how genius it is here to drop the verb. And I think it's smart, because he did, is missing something. What's the grammatical term for the thing missing? The pronoun. The pronoun? What kind of verb? How, what do we call it in grammar? Helping or linking verb, because it links between the two things here. So there's no link, no linkage. This is actually taken from where? From heart of darkness, important. By Joseph Conrad. This allusion or intertextuality is taken from a novel written around, I think, 1899 by Joseph Conrad. The novel is Heart of Darkness. This is the novel that Edward Said, the Palestinian Christian intellectual, did his PhD on. So if you are interested, look this up and see what Edward Said. But because Heart of Darkness, this is a journey of a European man, Kurtz, who went to Africa, to the heart of darkness. And again, usually the binary of Africans being uh, uncivilized, savages, dark, and the Europeans being civilized and superior, bringing light to this heart of darkness. In brief, Edward Said said that Joseph Conrad is bloody racist. Bloody racist. Extremely racist. But that's something else. But taking this... Kurtz was the, the European man, and he was a man who wanted to, you know, uh, to, to, to abuse, to abuse and to exploit Africa in a way. He was a violent man. And then, as we want to start the poem, we're stuck with another epitaph, another allusion. A penny for the old guy, look the old guy is capitalized. Do you know the gun gunpowder plot? Have you? Yeah, you know V V for Vendetta, yeah. the movie. It's inspired. This is a man. His name is Guy Fox. Who, during by the way, the time of Shakespeare, wanted to blow up the British Parliament. That's why it's the gunpowder plot. They brought dynamite, whatever. They had at that time gunpowder they wanted, but just in the nick of the hour, he was discovered and they were executed. Interestingly, they, they kind of celebrate this day. John Oliver, uh, last week tonight, was making fun of how the British people, but because if you're a stranger, you don't know, are they celebrating the fact that this man wanted to blow up the parliament? Or are they celebrating the fact that he failed? So a penny, this is from uh, a nursery for kids. A penny for the old guy, for this man. And then we begin the text. I'll, I'll go through it, uh, I'll read it, and then we can do some commentary uh, after that. 
We are the hollow men. We are the stuffed men. Leaning together, headpiece filled with straw, alas. Our dried voices, when we whisper together, are quiet and meaningless, as wind in dry grass or rats' feet over broken glass in our dry cellar. Shape without form, shade without color, paralyzed force. Direct eyes to death, other kingdom. Remember us, if at all, not as the, not as lost, violent souls, but only as the hollow men, the stuffed men. I dare not meet in dreams, in death's dream kingdom. These do not appear. There, the eyes are sunlight on a broken column. There is a tree swinging. The voices are in the winds singing more distant and more solemn than a fading star. Let me be no nearer in death's dream kingdom. Let me also wear such deliberate disguises, rat's coat, crow skin, cross staves. In a field, in a field behaving as the wind behaves no nearer. Not that final meeting in the twilight kingdom. This is the dead land. This is the cactus land. Here the stone, stone images, images are raised. Here they receive the supplication of a dead man's hand under the twilight of a fading star. Is it like this in this other kingdom? Waking alone at the hour when we are trembling with tenderness, lips that would kiss, form prayers to broken stone. The eyes are not here, there are no eyes here. In this valley of dying stars, in this hollow valley, this broken jaw of our lost kingdoms. In this last of meeting places, we grope together and avoid speech, gathered on this beach of that humid river sightless, unless the eyes reappear as the perpetual star, multifoliate rose of death, twilight kingdom, the hope only of empty men. Here we go around the prickly pear, here, prickly pear, prickly pear, here we go around the prickly pear at five o'clock in the morning. Between the idea and the reality, between the motion and the act, falls the shadow, for thine is the kingdom. Between the conception and the reaction, between the emotion and the response, falls the shadow. Life is very long. Between the desire and the spasm, between the potency and the existence, between the, the, essen the essence and the descent, falls the shadow. For thine is the kingdom. For thine is... Life is... For thine is the, this is the way the world ends, this is the way the world ends, this is the way the world ends, not with a bang, but a whimper. Hmm. Uh, what, what do you think? How do you feel? How does the poem make you feel? Hollow. Haven't you had breakfast just now? <laughs> How do you feel? What tone can you trace here? Dark. dark? Is there any hope? Just complete darkness? No hope? Depression? Loss? Pessimism? Hmm? Fragmentation? Chaos? Despair? I think no amount of pizza can make you feel good after reading this poem. I agree, this is a dark, bleak, grim poem. We could see glimpses here of hope with the falling star, the voices, the singing, the tree, but... I want to start from the, the ending here, the ending, the last thing. If you noticed in the last part, this is a poem that consists of five parts. You see, see the Roman one, two, three, four, five. 
I think this is the first time we see a repetition here, like this, like whole lines repeated. We talk about modernity, we talk about modern literature, we talk about the 20th century literature. But please don't take this the wrong way. When we speak about modernity in the 20th century, we say that the 20th century was the heyday of modernism. They wanted to change, you know, not follow the rules again. But it doesn't mean they started this. It doesn't mean modernity is time bound. Because when we spoke about John Donne, yeah. we said he's a modernist poet. George Herbert, he's also a modernist poet. When we spoke about the Romantics, we described them as. So modernity, modernism is, is an attitude, is a practice. When you go against the mainstream currents, when you try to change the rules of versification here in terms of, of poetry. But the heyday of modernism was 20th century with T.S. Eliot, Ezra Pound, and those people. But look at this repetition here. The, the italics gives the, the, the impression that this could be uh, another voice, a different voice from the, the speaker, so to speak. And this is the way the world ends. This is the way the world I, I usually read it like, like, you know, ascending here in how you should be, like, this is the way the world ends, this is the way the world ends, this is the way the world ends, and just with a rising intonation, not with a bang, but a whimper. But I, f I found the T.S. Eliot recitation on YouTube very interesting. He does it very quickly. This is the way the world ends, this is the way the world ends, this is the way the world ends, the, not with a, with a bang, but a whimper. I don't know why. But we can talk about this, we can comment on this, how uh, we, we speak about Tamim al Barghouti usually, when he recites his own poetry, he gives them like, or Rafif Ziyad or those poets. Uh, there's a, uh, a Muslim, Pakistani, British poet called uh, Suhaima Khan. She's fascinating. There, sometimes you read her poem and like, but when you listen to her reciting the poem, fascinating. It just comes, comes to life. But how much should we put into this? Like when somebody reads his own work, how does that contribute to understanding uh, the poem? It's, a, it's an issue. Not everybody can perfectly read. I'm not saying anything about T.S. Eliot. I can't say anything about T.S. Eliot, like anything bad. But if you look here at the end, there is a, you know a bang? What's a bang? Explosion. Huge explosion, yeah? Not just when you bang on the door, it's not like you're knocking, like there was a bang outside. Bang, bang, right? And then it's, there's an onomatopoeia, by the way, here. Bang. The sound of the word gives its, its meaning here. But, so this is the way the world ends. Not with a bang, but a whimper. What's a whimper? Any idea? Complaining? What's that? It's a soft, sound. soft sound? Is it like a sound of happiness, of uh, celebration? There is, there is a lot, it's like a sigh, but sometimes a sigh is a sigh of relief. It's like, we're done, right? Listen. Like, oh, I don't know how it should be done. But it's some kind of sigh that has pain, agony, suffering, despair, loss. Crying sounds. Not necessarily. Not necessarily because crying, sometimes there's, you know, we have tears of joy. This is pain, pure, utter, sheer pain and agony. What's the difference between the world ending in a bang and the world ending in a whimper. Why is this voice indicating that the world should or the world ends in a, in a whimper rather than a bang? Does it make a difference? Can you imagine the difference between death in a bang and death in a, in a, in a whimper? Okay, nice. I guess perfect speaking is... Uh-huh, cool. I think that it, it, it means that you do not really like die suddenly or directly. No, you suffer before you die. So it's I think this is the basic idea here. This is violent and quick. In a blink of an eye, you're dead. But a whimper 
indicates that it's been a long time. It takes a long time to die. It's a slow, horrible, horrible, agonizing death. Now you see this in movies. Uh, just two days ago, I was watching something, and uh, somebody's brother died, and she was like, "But did he die a quick death?" It's like, what? We, I find this very interesting how in, in American Hollywood movies, if somebody dies, you just want to make sure that he died or she died a quick death, that he didn't suffer, he didn't. Interesting. I, ca I also can kind of find a bang issue here uh, to be referencing how the whole world was created. Scientists, some scientists say that the whole world was created, there was chaos, and then there was this intergalactic explosion bang, the Big Bang Theory, not the TV show. And then because of this, you know, the solar system and Earth started later on. This happened like millions of years ago. But after the Big Bang, started, but after this Bang, came. Because those same scientists say that the, the world is also going to end in another bang. So we started in a bang and there's a possibility that the whole world is going, if, if there was a bang, then there were bangs, then one of these bangs is going to destroy, take us all. If this happens, it's going to be a blink of an eye. But a whimper indicates this long journey of pain and suffering, paying a heavy price for something. I'll come back to this at the end to try to make sense of this. Why is he saying this? So if we go back, Notice again, as a feature of uh, T.S. Eliot, actually, and many uh, uh, 20th century poets and authors, they always use these allusions and references. They always intertext. This could make some text really tough to, to digest. Because sometimes if you have a text, you want to deal with it, and all of a sudden there is a reference to another text. You want to go and check and see how this links to this. I personally love allusions and, and because it gives the text richness. It gives the text layers, other layers of, of meanings. Because uh, I believe that uh, nobody owns his or her, her, her own text. These are, let me say, hard inter instances of inter intertextuality. You can see it. But even if you don't see somebody quoting another text, there is always something in the text with the author being influenced by, by others, whether in ideas or, or something. But this is deliberate. He is telling us that there is something here. And I think because those two people, Kurtz and, old, uh, the, and Guy Fawkes, they were people who believed in chaos. You know? Chaos as a mean, violence as a means of, of, of change, of, as a mean of um, life. This man went to Africa to destroy Africa. This man wanted to destroy the British Parliament. So is this about violence? Is this about how humanity has become violent? Because remember, this is after the Great War. Over 20 million people died in, in Europe. We talk about white European Christian soldiers and civilians all dead at a time when intellectuals and philosophers believe that, some of them at least, believe that as we advance, with technology, with factories, we could uh, eradicate diseases and poverty and you know, wars and problems and we could build more understanding, more bridges between uh, societies, civilizations. And then all of a sudden we have, not all of a sudden of course, we have the Great War. 20 million people died. So many people, that's why people in, in, in the 1920s, 20s and 30s are usually described as the lost generation. But like here, when Israel bombs Gaza, two, three, five, ten people die, you kind of sometimes want to lose hope. Imagine you live at a time when 20 million people die. A violent death. So is this, is this why we are violent, we are hollow? So the poem again opens with this interesting Paradox. We are the hollow men. We are the stuffed men. What is it? Okay, that's why I, I, I know you like memes. I did this meme. T.S. Eliot saying, we are the hollow men. 
We are the stuffed men. There's a paradox here, right? So are we hollow or are we stuffed? What is it? Or can it be both? How can somebody be hollow and stuffed at the same time? Please. It can be hollow of, of hobbing, but stuffed hmm. from suffering. Okay. At the same time. Okay, interesting. I wanted to say like the same, um, hollow of, of virtue and hope, but stuffed with pain and hmm. Thank you. It could be stuffed, like actually stuffed, we have blood and etc. but hollow in our spirit. So, okay, thank you very much. These are very interesting ideas. We hollow, we devoid of what? Humanity, sanity, virtues, like you suggested, a hope. It can be stuffed with hollow. And stuffed with evil, bigotry, hate, probably materialism. When you read commentary about this poem, and I hate to do this, you will find, because you find people say, because there are references here to the headpiece and the straw, that this is an image of scarecrows. You know scarecrows in fields? Yeah. Scarecrows, khair al that uh, try, that uh, scare uh, birds away so they don't eat the crops or the corn or something. So imagine this. The, the empty, the, it's just straw, it's nothing. But they're stuffed. Leaning together, headpiece filled with straw, alas. The, the poem begins with we, the first person, plural, not singular. We are, this is everybody, inclusive. The whole society, everybody. It's just not the speaker, not somebody's feeling. Our dried voices, so there are voices here, but the voices are dried. And if your voice is dried, it's because you haven't spoken in a while, in a long while. And if you don't speak because you don't have anybody to speak to, you don't, I don't know, you, you're afraid, you're terrified, you don't want to, you can't, you're not allowed to. There are many possibilities here. When we whisper together, are quiet. So even when we speak, the, the speaking here is the speech is whispering. And again, we mentioned this before. I think with William Blake, the nurse's song, you whisper when you are terrified. You whisper when you are uh, telling a secret. So you don't want to be heard. You're afraid. But even these voices, dried voices in whispers, are quiet. Not only quiet, but they are meaningless. They, they have no, no meaning. We don't understand each other. There's no communication here. Lack of communication being a very significant theme for T.S. Eliot and also in early 20th century uh, poetry. As wind, and then we have double uh, similes here. I like these similes. As, so the, the whispers, are, uh, the, the voices are meaningless as quiet, uh, are quiet and meaningless as wind in dry grass. It's useless. But look at the second one, how graphic it is. Or rat's feet over broken glass in our dry cellar. You know a cellar, the basement of a house, you know, wine cellar, something. So why are those people there in the, cell, in the basement, in the dark? Are they hiding? Is this the end of the world? Are these the final, the last people alive? But they're not alone. There's this simile that there could be this image of uh, you living with rodents. But look at this interesting thing, original image. The voices we make are as meaning, meaningful as the sounds that the, the feet of the rats make when they step over broken glass. Whatever that means. Or rats' feet over broken glass. <coughs> I don't claim to understand exactly what he means, but look at how this ambiguous thing, he's this image, this graphic image he creates in us. Is he spooking us away? Is he telling us? Think when you go home, think of how uh, the, a, a, rat, a rat's feet would sound on broken glass, not, not ordinary. I think this is, this is the same sound that 
sound effect that is uh, usually seen in movies, like uh, when you dry grass, the same exact sound is when like uh, shat some shattered grass. I can't grass. claim to have heard this, like the uh, the the rat's feet on. But it's meaningless. It doesn't make music. There's no idea behind it. What does it mean? What does it indicate? It's just broken glass and then rats. Except the fact that we are horrified. We are... What, are we paying attention to this now? Is this what we care about? The rats feed on over broken glass and we are leaving everything else aside? Shape, and then comes, there should be a stanza here, sorry, a space here. It's in, the, it's in your book. And then comes the judgment. Shape without form. Shade without color, paralyzed force, gesture without motion. What does that even mean? What is shape without, what is shape? Shape is the form, and the form is the shape, basically. Shade, how can a shade have no color? It's black, yeah, right? Dark. Paralyzed force, if it is a force, how can it be paralyzed? If it's gesture, this is a gesture. And if you gesture, gesture, you, you make a move, you motion to somebody. These are oxymorons all, you know, an oxymoron? Yes. Two words that are contradictory, like when you say terrible beauty, uh, Tough love, uh, bittersweet, a good teacher. <laughs> yeah? So shape without form. Probably, I'm not sure if he is he indicating that we have the potential, but we're not making good use of it. Shade without color, paralyzed force. Like if he's talking about humanity, about man or woman, we have the potential to be good, to build to create, to end war and suffering and pain. But at the same time, we are paralyzed. We have probably chosen to paralyze ourselves. We paralyzed ourselves. Those who have crossed with direct eyes to death's other kingdom. This is an indication of probably people who died and went to the other side. This is a reference to Dante. He is, there are so many references to Dante, you know, Dante. Uh, the Divine Comedy. Uh, there's this river, if you cross the river, you go to the other side, that's death. That's where you go possi possibly to heaven. Okay? So those who have died, with direct eye, look, uh, crossed with direct eyes to death's other kingdom. I find also, if you notice before, punctuation marks, they're absent, right? So there should be here a full stop, a semicolon, yeah? But then all of a sudden you'll find um, commas used unnecessarily. You don't have to use a comma here with direct eyes. You don't say, I'm going to school. You don't add a comma here. Is, it, is this, again, something to reflect the, act, the status of lawlessness? There are no rules here. Chaos. Chaos, Chaos possibly. With direct eyes to death, other kingdom, remember us. I, I saw somebody... By the way, if you like this poem or other poems, try to translate them. It's a good exercise into Arabic. I, I read somebody translating this into, remember us, tadhakkaruna. Dealing with remember as, as imperative form. It's not. Remember is the verb for, what's, what's the subject for, for, for remember? Those. Those who have crossed this is adjectival clause, a prepositional phrase, prepositional phrase, remember us. Those who died, remember us. Those who crossed the river to the other side, remember us. If at all, they don't remember us, but if they do, when they do, or if they do, if at all, not as lost violent souls. We are soulless. Everything is dry. There's no life here. We're stuffed, we're hollow. They remember us. I think if, if this is a reference to the uh, uh, two allusions here, the two people here mentioned in the opening, uh, what's his name, Kurtz and Guy Fawkes, those were violent people. And some people, some violent people sometimes want to be remembered as violent people. 
But if you do, if you cause destruction, if you bring chaos on people, people might not remember you as you wanted, as you wished, as violent. Because also violent here indicates action. There's no action here. You can't even speak. You are you paralyzed. But only as the hollow men. The stuffed men. The hollow was stuffed. And I, I think I like what you suggested here, being stuffed with emptiness or stuffed with evil, vices, bigotry, hate, violence, insanity, inhumanity, injustice, oppression, destruction, but hollow, we're empty, we have nothing good there. And then in the second part, the poem moves to the first person pronoun singular, I. And I find it interesting, eyes, I. Because there were, the eyes are significant here, seeing is significant. It's a theme. Eyes, I dare not meet in dreams in this dream kingdom. Which eyes? Is it the eyes of those people who passed? But these eyes, he doesn't want to see even in dreams. Do they bring nightmares? What do they do? In, in death, dream, kingdom, those do not appear. There, look at the comma here, and also here. There, the eyes, the eyes are. But if you look at this a little bit, this stanza, there's some kind of hope. There's a glimpse here of hope, glimmering hope. Because at least there, you know, the, eye, the eyes are sunlight, and the tree, it's true, it's just one tree, but it's swinging, and the voices are singing. There's some kind of singing here. But the first part is... Dry, thank you. Dry, I like this word. Nothing. Futile, futility. The, sun, the eyes are sunlight on a broken column. There are so many references and sim like a lot of symbolism here, especially with, uh, I'm not going to get into this unless you like to do it yourselves. There is a tree swinging. Look at this, there is a tree swinging. I think there's a guy who recited this poem in uh, mov the movie Apocalypse Now. Have you watched this? should watch this movie. A guy recites uh, this poem. It's also available on YouTube. You can uh, listen. It's fascinating. It shows this, like the, like the way you read it. But you could have just said, there is a tree swinging without the comma. Unnecessarily added here. But significant, I'm not generally, grammatically speaking, unnecessarily. But it adds to this impact that the slow, so you can't express yourself, you can't speak. And voices are in the winds singing. So this is positive. This is a positive note. More distant and more solemn than a fading star. This is again, if a star, again, there could be some Christian symbolism. By the way, some people take uh, T.S. Eliot to be a religious man and this poem to be a pure religious uh, text. I don't like to do that, but again, it's up to you. So there could be here a reference because I think in Christianity, when Jesus was born, there was this star that appeared somewhere in Palestine, over Palestine. But this star is fading. It's still there, but it's fading. Does it symbolize uh, Christian, uh, Christendom? Does it symbolize, uh, symbolize Western uh, civilization? Let me, because he's here, there's some kind of begging here. Let me be no nearer in this dream kingdom. I don't want to be near to this. And that's why I find it very difficult. I, when I listen to people say this poem is about this or is about that, I really find it confusing. I think T.S. Eliot is deliberately trying to confuse us, to make this whole chaotic. Because if there is hope, right? We said there is hope here, right? Mm -hmm. The light, the singing voices. It means, let's, like, I think in the wasteland, he says something about the red rock. Let's go under the red rock or something. But here... The opposite is happening. Let me be no nearer to that. I don't want to be next to this hope. Why? Is this total despair, giving up? Because if we take the hope, build civilization again, if this poem, I take it usually as to be about the failure of Western civilization. When two, 20 million people died for nothing, that's a failure, that's a total failure. So is he indicating that? The light we build on, the civilization we build on, is going eventually to implode and explode. If we build it again, if we stick clutch at the little hope we have, 
What's going to be the result in 100, 200, 1,000, 2,000 years? Another kind of destruction. Look into this. In death, dream kingdom, let me, all, not, let me also wear such deliberate disguises. Rats go, remember the rat? Uh, cross can, cross tails. Cross tails could be the cross itself or where you stick the scarecrows. But this is again somebody deliberate disguises. I don't, I, I take this as, and again, attempt to run away, escape this situation. Even if you have to disguise under the coat of a rat. Is this again a choice? Like I'd rather be a rat, I'd rather be a rodent than a human being. Disguising, running away from the little glimpse of hope we could be having. In a field, behaving as the wind behaves no nearer. Not that final meeting in the twilight kingdom. This is the dead land. This is, this is cactus land. Is it the cactus land or cactus land? I have to check this. You know cactus? Yes. Mm -hmm. The kind that grows in the desert, that doesn't, uh, sabar, shok, sabar and could indicate even the name in Arabic meaning patience or creating this something. But this grows without you taking care of it, without irrigating. It, it's usually available in the desert. If you go to Australia and these places, there's a lot of it there. Indicating probably uh, absence of humanity, civilization, not, not, no trees, no crops here. This, uh, but this is a declaration. This is the dead land. And again, the dead land, but cactus again indicates some kind of life. There is something. We've not gone yet. So why is he giving us these uh, glimpses of hope? Here, the stone images are raised. There are stone images. I don't know why. When I, every time I think of stone images, I think of you know, the civilization man built. Buildings, the high building, buildings, the factories, the machines, the cars, the, the train. Being stone are raised, they receive, and these things, these buildings, they receive supplication. You know supplication? Prayers. So we no longer pr pray to God. We're no longer spiritual, we're no longer pious, we no longer have the faith we had in the past. We only pray to what? To concrete, to stone. And look at this, the supplication of a dead man's hand. So who receives the supplication of a dead man's hand? Stone. The building, the stone, the images. The raised, the stone images. So look at this. And if this is, one, two, three, four, five. If this is a hand here, arm praying to this, and it's the, the hand of a dead man, the man is dead. What I see here is the fact that this, the death of millions of people is viewed probably by those people in power, in authority, the rich people, the leaders, as some kind of sacrifice for them. They don't look at this dead hand or the dead man or the million of people uh, dead as a, as a tragedy, the tragedy of all tragedies, but probably as something necessary so that humanity and life continues. What benefit does again the prayer from a dead man, not only a dead man, from a dead man's hand would give to the, the stone images? I find this very, I keep thinking about this because it's haunting. It's like one man's poison is another man's meat, one man's uh, death is another man's, I don't know what, uh, more money. Like in, in, in wars, we, have, we see this. There are so many cartoons depicting the leaders getting richer and richer while people just dying, suffering, losing uh, limbs. Supplication under the twinkle of a fading star. Is it like this in this, uh, this other kingdom? Is it going to be like this? The pain, the suffering, when we die? Is he questioning, uh, again, Christianity? Is he questioning religion? Because in, in Christianity and even in Islam, when you suffer, the more you suffer in real life, the more, uh, you know, what's that? 
uh, the more forgiveness you get, the more uh, ranks you get. But if we are living this horrible life, and then when we die, how is it going to be? Is it like this in death, other kingdom, waking alone? Look at this, aloneness. Fragmentation, somebody said fragmentation in the, in the beginning. At the hour when we are trembling with tenderness. And again, it's some positive image here. We're trembling, true, but there's tenderness. Lips that would kiss. What are they doing instead of? They're praying, not for God. They form prayers for broken stone again. Is this about materialism? Is this about destroying ourselves, our lives, our spirituality, our humanity, our sanity for nothing, for stone? I'm raising questions because I want you to think about this. I like this alone thing. The eyes, remember the eyes, seeing is a theme. There's something about seeing in Hamlet I can't remember. Like seeing is believing, like is seeing believing, is believing seeing. When you see something, is it true? How accurate? So the eyes are not here. There are no eyes here. So those hollow men, stuffed men, are also blind. But this could be not the physical blindness, but some kind of spiritual <laughs> emptiness. and Probably, like, in this valley of dying stars, again, the, even the stars, but again, not dead, they're dying. So again, there is this bit of life. I'm, I'm, I'm highlighting this, the fact that he throws here glimpses here and there, because I want to do something with that in the end. In this, even the valley is hollow. This broken jaw of our lost kingdoms, interesting metaphor here, how the or personification, the, the lost kingdoms being a human being, but the jaw broken, even the jaw is broken. If it is a symbol of speaking, talking, there's no communication here. In this last of meeting places, we grow together because there are no eyes here. You, you, when you wake up in the middle of the night, no electricity, it's dark, you usually grope your way to the fridge to munch something, right? That is, this is groping. You just don't walk freely and quickly because you don't want to hit something, uh, a cupboard or step on stupid blocks, building blocks. That's groping. Not only groping, not only inability to see, we avoid speech. We avoid it. Stanza one, there was a dry voice, no voice. Even when we whispered, it was as useful, as meaningful as the sounds made by rats when they step on broken glass. Nothing, futile. But here there is again a deliberate attempt to avoid speech. Avoid speech gathered on this beach of the tumid river. This again, this is from Dante, where again crossing the river. Those who crossed have crossed uh, to death's other kingdom. We're waiting to go to the other side. But this is a situation, look at this. This is a situation where we can't even die. We're dead, but we're not dead. We're dead, but we're not alive. We want to die. People are gathering the humid river, the overflowing river. That takes you to the other side. You're not even, you can't do that. You, while you're gathering here, you are alone. There's loneliness, there's hollowness, there's silence. And everybody is blind. Again, insisting on this, sightless. But unless gives this, okay, except there could be some hope. Unless. The eyes reappear, of course. So we're sightless, we're blind, we grow. As the perpetual star, could be another reference to the star that brought Jesus to us. Perpetual star, multifoliate throws, probably uh, basically, there's a lot of symbolism here to God, to Christianity, to hope. So is he saying, let's go under the rock of religion, of death, twilight kingdom, the hope 
only of empty men. What is it? What is it that empty men hope for usually? What do you hope for if, you, if somebody is empty from inside? Sorry, not be empty? Dying? Or is this like our hope is just for the star itself to reappear? To find new hope? Find new hope. But I think, before you say that, I think if you are empty, you don't think of good positive things. You think of like what? Of eating more? Of no. If you, if, if somebody thinks, of, sorry, don't think of dying. This is not, uh, but if you even think of dying, it means like you got to a point where you lost hope, you, 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 you desperate, something. So this choice is still intellectual, against two sides, totally. But this is a person who is empty, hollow. What would you be hoping for? At least not to suffer. At least not to suffer? No. I, I, if you, if you, I don't know, if you feel that you're suffering and you are in pain, it doesn't mean that you're totally empty. Because it means you, you feel, you have some kind of feelings that make you realize that you are, you want something. You want to change this reality, this bad reality you have. But then we have the last part. Again, look at the italics. In the last part, we have a lot of italics because I think there's another voice here, actually more than one voice. <coughs> here we go around the prickly pear, prickly pear, prickly pear, prickly pear, sabr nafsu, like the fruit or the, uh, the cactus. And this is taken from a nursery rhyme for kids, a song that is a happy song, but here there's an irony because what are we going around? Because in the harvest, in the past, people would be going around some kind of tree, as praying for fertility, hoping for more, you know, produce. But what are we doing here? Prickly pear is not that, you know, useful. It's thorny, right? It's harmful in a way. But look at how they, the singing here. Here we go around the prickly pear, prickly pear, prickly pear. Here we go around the prickly pear at five o'clock in the morning. There could be a reference, sorry? Frightening, like you can imagine this very like gloomy atmosphere and someone I don't know hollow singing. This. Because this is the ritual. This is if you're hollow, you're not going to be praying to God, hoping for salvation or resurrection or even. And this is this is this ritual of praying of worshiping, worshiping what stone, prickly pear. There could be a reference here to the time Jesus was was born at five o'clock. Instead of being the spiritual, the good people we have to be, what are we doing? We're wasting our time doing nothing. Between the idea and the reality, between the motion and the act falls a shadow. Shadow probably means death here. For thine is the kingdom. This is biblical uh, term. For thine is there's this thing, a uh, verse from the Bible, although I walk in the shadow of the valley of death, I fear no evil, something like this, because your rod and your staff guide me or support me. But look at everything, idea, reality, motion, act, falls a shadow. For thine is the kingdom. Death is the kingdom, not God here. Between the conception and the creation, the emotion and the response, falls the shadow. Life is long. Look at the long vowels here. Life is long. Imagine the suffering, the pain, the despair. Imagine that. And you can't even die. Whew. And it, so it's actually, life is very long too. Not just long. Not sure if there is a reference here to Sebel, you know Sebel? What did she uh, do, Sebel? Mythology. She wished for eternal life. It's in the wasteland. She wished for eternal life. But she forgot to ask eternal health. And then she kept growing old and old and old and old. She became tiny. People put it in a, in a, in a, in a, in a bottle and every time that the kids would be teasing her and say, Belle, what do you want? I want to die. But she can't have it. 
And that's why we have careful what you wish for, the saying, careful what you wish for, it's probably from this situation, between the desire and the spasm, all kind of paradoxes, the thing and its opposite, the binaries, the desire and spasm, the potency and existence, the essence and the descent, falls the shadow. And I honestly don't exactly know what he means here. Like, is he saying death is everywhere? But just now, people c couldn't die. We are the undead, the walking dead. Possibly. Yeah, I like this idea where death is a luxury. You can't afford it. <coughs> it's some kind of punishment there. For thine is the kingdom. And this is the most favorite part of all. Now, the, for thine is the kingdom was probably said by another voice. The voice of what? A priest, a religious man, some kind of God. And then the speaker in the poem, Kai, like, mirrors this, wants to imitate this, but he can't have it, he can't, for thine is, life is, for thine is the, if you do this in your exams, your English teachers will be like, giving you, uh, you know, minus, but look at this, I think this is the most poetic thing that has ever been written, if you say, for thine is, I don't know, for thine is, Good, life is good, life is bad, life is horrible, life is chaos. It's going to be limiting. It's going to be say, oh, this poem is it's open. Yeah. And again, inability to, to, to express yourself, there's no speech here, but you can't describe this. Or is this, or is he saying life is for thine is nothing? Maybe life, is empty. life is empty, thank you, hollow, no, no, nothing. No, but no, describe. like even empty or hollow, there are like, no words can describe how hollow, how empty, how horrible, how miserable, how agonizing, how painful this is. For thine is, life is, for thine, wait, okay, we'll see this. For thine is the, and by the way, this is where the poem ends. That's the ending of the poem. And this is the comment, this is the voice, the main voice in the poem stops here. But the comment is the other voice in italics comments on, you could, I think, in the apocalypse now, there's this idea that the speaker here is dying. So has the, spo the speaker here said this and then died without being able to express himself or herself? Is this death? Is this it? Or you're too stunned to express yourself, to react to this. For thine is, life is, for thine is the, and then like. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is the point of complete despair. For, yeah, I like, it's utter sheer despair. But, but it's also there's a disappointment here, because you come, he gave you hope, somewhere in the poem, I think this is one of the darkest poems. If it is totally, purely, 100% dark, I wouldn't have liked it. But he throws here, you know, some glimpse here, some hope. There's like, okay, okay, so the ending is going, but we have an anticlimax here. He gave us a little bit of hope just to step on us, tread on us again. It's like sometimes we have this in movies. Somebody dies, and before they die, it's like, so I killed me. And like, oh, but then the person who killed me, and then he dies. It's like, wow. Oh. <laughs> you should have said it. Just one, was one word. So how, how do we understand this ending? How would you comment on the ending? How would you read it? Again, go, please, go today. I'm not sure, like yesterday, in, in, in the, the classes I gave yesterday, like, I had many people say, wow, I love this poem. I'm not sure whether because, this is because we are, you are dark or because this is a really good poem. But go read, the, uh, res listen to the recitations on YouTube. You will love them. And focus on the ending, how the ending is, is, is recited and how, that, uh, how you connect that with the, with the meaning. Please. Mm. Who's hallucinating? The person himself. He is like, hmm. he's like done with all of what he did and what he 
Okay, nice. But I don't, I don't, I don't want to take it as I think there is another voice. No, it's a voice inside of him. Okay, that's that. That it's paradoxical, but it may it, it makes sense. Uh, throughout the whole poem, I tried to connect it. Or I I don't know. Uh, I connected it with the last line because it's like uh, he's saying that uh, people in life they worship life. They do not really focus on their the life after. So when they when their life comes to an end and they start losing everyone around them, they start. Uh, it's like I don't, I hate to give this image, but it's like when uh, cutting the head of, a, of a, an animal, for example. Mm -hmm. I hate to give this image mm. again. Uh, and you do not do this properly, so the animal keeps suffering. And throughout this suffering, every time he starts getting this kind of like, okay, I might live. But no, wait, I, I'm going to die. Mm. Okay, I might live because like the head... So how do you take this commentary? The, the is this a different voice? Whose voice is this? And in what, what tone do you have here? Yes. Is this celebratory? Like, it, is this no. uh, somebody celebrating? No. It's not celebrating. Somebody... It's very dark. It's like warning. warning. A warning? Yeah. So just commentary, objective commentary. But we said in the previous stanza that they cannot afford even death. Mm. So now he is like reaching the end, no more suffering. So it's, it's, easy. it's good. good. It's positive note because we want to cross to the second, to the other, uh, the, the the side, the the bank, the other bank of the river. Yeah, possible. Look at this. How the, this the ending with the whimper also ends the poem. The poem ends with the whimper. And this is the, how the world ends. But I like, I don't know, I like to take this as some kind of spiteful tone. You know, spiteful? Like, yeah, you died, you deserve this. And that's why the repetition here makes it even, it's like adding what uh, insult to injury. You know? Somebody falls, it's painful, and like, ha ha, it just makes it more, more painful here. This is the way the world ends. This is the way the world ends. This is the way the world ends. Allah la yuruddak. Don't laugh. This is not a, a funny pa comic poem. But you do this. Like, uh, today do it with one of your friends, just uh, as an experiment. Tell them something repeatedly three times. Like, if till she tells you, I haven't studied in like a hundred years. And just keep telling her and getting closer to her like, it serves you right. It serves you right. It serves you right. Like, oh, oh, oh. Spite, there's this beautiful idiom. To cut one's nose to spite your face. I think this is also part of this. This, this spite, you know, they, like you're teasing somebody. But also, you're part of the problem here. The speaker, the voice is part of the problem. Okay, this is what I, what I feel. It's, it's up to you how, how you want to take this. And finally, the bang and the wimber. The bang, the bang here is loud, is sudden, is abrupt. The wimper is slow, painful, agonizing. And, you know, I don't know. I think he's suggesting that because of what we do, what we did, a failure of civilization, we don't even deserve a bang. We don't deserve it. What have we done to deserve this bang at the end? We have done nothing but death, destruction, wars, as, as, as people, as human beings. If we die in a bang, it's like, you know, when somebody goes in a bang, it's like celebrating his or her departure. Goodbye. But we have to pay a price. We have to pay a heavy price for what we have done, for what we have brought upon ourselves. Please. Very quickly. Yes. Because the poem starts with giving two allusions of part of this sentence, can't we consider the sound or the perspective in the poem as the sound of the victims of those two persons? Possible. Possible, like you died, it serves you right. You brought this on us. But I, 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 I like to take it more than this. Please. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Now, this is the way the world ends. He is like insisting on me speaking out, and then uh, he's suggesting that um, silence is the thing that kills Lack of communication. Okay, you're taking this positively. So this is a man, uh, you know, uh, somebody dying and somebody finishing the job. That's a positive reading. I agree that it's about, at least it's giving us a closure that eventually we will die. We will not keep suffering in these things because throughout the whole home, I feel like... But that's, that's not an ordinary death. This is not the death we want. But at least we'll die. Okay. Uh, nice. Like Thank you for saying at least we'll die and that's good. <laughs> Interesting. One more, one final thing, Jaima. Uh, th this speaker or this one? Okay. So this is about depression. Okay. How is that? How can you make sense of this? So this is a man hallucinating yeah. mental illness. A mental illness is a serious thing. Sadly, we don't pay attention to mental illness. Could you? So you, you're talking about this being just one, uh, uh, one person's struggle, internal conflict and struggle with mental illness. Possible. That's why I don't, listen, I hate to say uh, the theme of this poem is. If I do this, I'll be really, really doing injustice to you and to the poem. I'm limiting many things. Examine the poem, take it, enjoy it, absorb it, look at the structure. The final thing in just one, less one, than one minute I want to do, is again, look at the structure. This is called free verse. You know? Free verse, even more experimental than the poetry of John Donne and even the romantics there. For the first time, we, have, we see fragments here, sentences, no verbs. Even here with the, 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 these oxymorons here, no verbs at all. The lines. Even the meter, the rhymes, this is called free verse. Remember we said there is the, the, the classical poetry, then there's blank verse, blank verse, where you don't have, you have the, the meter, the rhythm, the music, but there is no rhyme at the end. But here, basically, you don't have both. Some people will say this is not poetry. This is some kind of prose. I think this is the most beautiful, most poetic poetry, if there is something as... Uh, as such. I'll stop here. Uh, if you have a question, stay behind. We can talk more about whatever you like.